and DeMeo from the Department of Genetics. I just want to get my timer started. So I'm going to tell, talk to you about some recent work we've done on human papillomavirus infection. And I want to turn the lights down. So if you want it, fall asleep. That's OK. Try not to snore. OK. So um, papillomavirus, well, first off, I should say I have a disclosure. Um, I'm an inventor on an app, a patent application related to this work. So papillomaviruses are important human pathogens. Uh, these are small and simple viruses with a single uh, DNA molecule genome. They only encode about 10 proteins. And like most DNA viruses, they replicate in the nucleus. They're very important medically because they cause cancer. In fact, about 5% of all human cancer deaths are caused by cancers caused by these viruses, and the most prominent of which is, is cervical cancer. Um, however, as you heard last week from Doug Lowy, there are wonderful vaccines that prevent infection by many of these viruses. And uh, we're hopeful that within the next few decades, we'll be able to eliminate the major cancers caused by these viruses. But we have a long way to go. But many people are not vaccinated still. As I said, these are simple viruses. Here's a picture of the viral particle. Um, it does not have a membrane envelope. It's a non-envelope virus. There are only two proteins in the capsid, both encoded by the virus. The L1 major protein and then the L2 protein, which is the so-called minor capsid protein, as I'll convince you, I hope, it's actually a very important protein, as I said, a DNA genome. The um, virus particle is actually a very efficient DNA delivery machine. It does many different things. It protects the genome from the elements when it's outside of cells, but it binds to cells, gets taken up by cells, delivers the genome to the nucleus, the site of replication, disassembles to release the genome so it can replicate, and then and evades the immune response. I'm going to tell you about one particular aspect that we've been focusing on, and that is the delivery of the viral genome to the nucleus. When we began this work, almost nothing was known about this process. In fact, our, our knowledge could be summarized by this cartoon. Uh, HPV enters the endosome, a miracle occurs, and it gets to the nucleus. And like this character here, we felt we should be a little bit more explicit in step two. So um, we decided to undertake a, a genetic analysis of HPV entry. So Alex Lepofsky, who's a grad student in my laboratory, conducted an siRNA whole genome screen to identify cellular proteins required for infection. And based on Alex's results and some imaging studies done by Wei Zhang in the laboratory, a very unexpected picture emerged. And that is the virus takes a very unusual, in fact, unprecedented route to the nucleus. After it's endocytosed, it travels through transport vesicles to the trans-Golgi network, then into the Golgi apparatus, then into the, to the ER before it finally gets into the nucleus. So the virus is, is inside membrane-bound organelles through its entire route to the nucleus. This is probably a good immune evasion strategy. It avoids cytoplasmic immune sensors, but uh, really is a quite uh, unusual path. This pathway is called the retrograde transport pathway. I'll refer to it as that. We got interested in this first step. How is it that the virus goes from the endosome, where many viruses are, to the retrograde pathway where nothing, no other virus is known to, uh, to utilize in this way? And in particular, on a protein called retromer, which is a cellular protein that normally carries other cell proteins um, into the retrograde pathway. And what's the role of retromer in virus infection? So we, to study this, um, we did some imaging studies initially and asked, what's the consequence of knocking down retromer uh, for infection? We used an assay called PLA for proximity ligation assay. In this assay, a uh, fluorescent signal is generated if the virus is in a particular organelle. So here we're looking at virus in the endosome. As you can see, at eight hours after infection in wild-type cells, the virus gets into the endosome, it's endocytosed. But by, eight, by 16 hours, it's left. And that's because the virus has exited the endosome and gone to the trans-Golgi network. However, if you look in knockdown cells, where we knock down the retromer, you see a very different picture. The virus gets in just fine. So retromer knockdown does not affect internalization. However, it never leaves the endosome. In fact, it accumulates here. So when you knock down the retromer, the virus is impaired for endosome exit. So uh, and that's shown schematically here. We knock down the retromer. The virus accumulates in the endosome. It never makes it to these more distal compartments. 
So that suggests that perhaps the, the virus is using the retromer to enter cells in some way. And we wondered, is the virus a uh, actual cargo of the retromer? So we asked, does retromer bind to the virus? And so uh, Andrea Pope in my laboratory looked at the sequence of this L2 minor capsid protein and found a short sequence here, FYL, that looked a little bit like a retromer binding site. So we decided to test that. She constructed peptides that covered three different sections of the L2 protein, labeled the peptides with biotin, and then did a, a pull-down experiments. So she added each one of these peptides to cell extracts, pulled down with streptavidin, and then blotted for retromer. And as you can see, uh, the C-terminal peptide that contains this putative binding site, in fact, binds retromer very well, while these other peptides fail to bind retromer, suggesting that, in fact, the virus, this segment, in fact, does bind uh, to the cellular trafficking molecule. She then uh, constructed mutations uh, in this binding site or in this site and asked if that block binding, and it does, so that site is required for binding. And with Chris Bird, a colleague in cell biology, we show that binding is direct using recombinant proteins. She then inserted this mutation into virus and asked, does it block infection? And in fact, it does block, uh, this binding site is required for entry. And in fact, if you mutate this site, the virus accumulates in the endosome, just like what happens if you knock down retromer. So if you knock down retromer or mutate the binding site, you get the same phenotype, namely the virus is trapped in the endosome and uh, infection can't progress. So this says that in fact, the retromer uh, delivers HPV into the retrograde pathway uh, for transport to the nucleus. That then raises a question, how does this happen? How does the retromer access uh, HPV? This represents the HPV particle. Uh, we see mostly L1, which forms a shell of the part of the virus. And maybe this little nubbin of L2 sticks out, so it can bind the retromer. But there's a problem. And the problem is there's a membrane in the way. So the virus is in the, endosome, is in the lumen of the endosome, whereas the retromer is in the cytoplasm. So these two molecules can't see one another. So that then led us to propose a, a, an unusual model that basically this L2 protein, which is normally part of this non-envelope virus, is actually able to stick through the, the endosomal membrane, protrude into the cytoplasm, where it can bind retromer. And this is a very unusual thing. Proteins don't tend to do this. So we felt it was important to test whether or not the L2 protein actually protrudes into the cytoplasm. To do that, Peng Wei Zhang in my laboratory set up a split GFP assay, and the principle was the following. Uh, you can take GFP, which is a fluorescent protein, but cut it into two parts, a short part of only 16 amino acids and, the, and then the rest of the protein. Both of these segments are, they don't, do not fluoresce on their own. However, if they're expressed in the same compartment, they can self-associate, reform, reconstitute GFP, and reconstitute fluorescence. So this can be used as a measure for whether these two halves of GFP are in the same cellular compartment. So the idea then is to fuse this little bit of GFP to the L2 protein, the end of the L2 protein that we think protrudes through the membrane, and express GFP 1 to 10 in the cytoplasm, and then ask whether or not we can generate fluorescence. So uh, Peng Wei, uh, made virus particles that contain GFP fused to L2, we infected cells, these cells have been engineered to express GFP1 to 10 only in the cytoplasm. So if L2 stays inside the endosome, there's no fluorescence. But if this end of L2 sticks through the endosome into the cytoplasm, it can reconstitute GFP uh, and, and generate fluorescence. So uh, we did the experiment, uh, and in fact, it worked. This shows if we infect cell, if we, these are the reporter cells with GFP1 to 10 in them. If we infect with wild-type virus that doesn't have GFP11, there's no fluorescence. But if you uh, fuse L2 to the end of GFP11, uh, then you get this nice cytoplasmic fluorescence, exactly you, as you would predict if the L2 protein is protruding into the cytoplasm. This is true for HPV type 16, which is the most common type in human cancers. And what I've talked to you about so far is entirely uh, involved 16. However, uh, it's also true for HPV 5, which is a quite distinct HPV type that infects skin. So then, um, how does this protrusion occur? Again, as I said, this is a very unusual uh, reaction. Well, uh, Penguin looked at the sequence of the end of L2, and here's this retromer binding site that I mentioned before, this L4L sequence, retromer binds directly to this. But she noticed there's another sequence downstream here that's very basic. R represents arginine, K represents lysine, two basic amino acids. 
And this sequence, or a close variant of it, is absolutely conserved in all 400 sequenced papillomaviruses. So this emerged hundreds of millions of years ago and has been maintained in papillomaviruses. So um, we wondered, perhaps, that this sequence uh, might be important for infection. And in fact, it looks to us, to our eyes, it looked like a sequence we already knew something about, which were called cell-penetrating peptides. <clears throat> so cell-penetrating peptides are short protein sequences that can deliver proteins into cells. They were first discovered over 30 years ago. The most common type, in fact, the first one identified was an HIV TAT, has a very similar sequence to the papillomaviruses, and these are called cationic. In fact, even polyarginine can suffice to deliver proteins into cells. Uh, cell penetrating peptides have been widely explored as drug delivery tools to deliver peptides into cells, though as far as I know, they're not actually in clinical use yet. Um, however, despite 30 years of study, we really don't know what they do in biology. The natural role of CPPs is basically very poorly understood. And we thought maybe we stumbled upon a, a, a real activity of these sequences to deliver the papillomavirus into the retrograde pathway. So first we asked whether or not the sequence was required for infection. Uh, so we just simply replaced it with, with um, uh, six alanines, and this totally abolishes infection. Not surprising, as I said, this is a very conserved sequence. Similarly, three arginines also is defective, and three arginines is not long enough to serve as a good CPP. So Peng then decided to actually test directly, is this sequence, does it have cell penetrating activity using the standard assay, which is to fuse it to uh, GFP, purify fusion proteins and bacteria, then add them to cells. And so this is a wild type sequence with a wild type uh, um, basic region and then a couple of mutants. And as you can see, when we add them to Hackett keratinocytes, the wild type protein is very efficiently taken up by cells, causing the cells to fluoresce. And we're looking here at intracellular fluorescence. On the other hand, the 6A mutant is, is totally defective for uptake, and the 3R mutant is almost totally defective. It's quite impaired for uptake. And this parallels exactly the phenotype of viruses that carry these mutations, in that the wild type virus obviously infects cells well. The 6A mutant is totally defective for infection, and the 3R mutant is, is quite impaired for infection. Consistent with the idea that this segment might be important for um, infection by acting as a cell penetrating peptide. So based on this, we hypothesized the L2 cell penetrating peptide drives the C terminus of L2 through the endosomal membrane into the cytoplasm, where it's in a position to bind retromer. We can test that with the split GFP assay. So here, show, this shows a split GFP assay. The wild type protein generates fluorescence, as shown here. The sorry, wild type virus generates fluorescence, as shown here. But if you mutate this uh, cell penetrating peptide sequence, you'll almost entirely block protrusion. So you actually do need the cell penetrating peptide sequence in order to get through the membrane into the cytoplasm. And if you build these mutations into virus, uh, the cell penetrating mutant uh, fails to bind retromer in infected cells, as we predict, because it's in the wrong place, doesn't get into the cytoplasm, and furthermore, this mutant accumulates in the endosome. So based on all this, we can propose a somewhat coherent model for how this step of infection takes place. When the virus is in a cytose, it initially goes into the lumen of the endosome. Then, under the action of the cell penetrating peptide, the, uh, this protein uh, uh, protrudes through the membrane into the cytoplasm, where it can bind retromer and other trafficking factors that are essential for infection. Uh, furthermore, once this happens, we think there may be a transmembrane domain at the end, of, end terminus of the L2 protein that Sam Campos described that uh, perhaps anchors L2 into, into the endosomal membrane. So this really is a remarkable reaction, if you think about it. This is a non-envelope virus that's uh, composed of soluble proteins under some trigger, perhaps low pH, the CPP becomes activated, allows this protein to, to stick through the membrane, bind essential factors, and be converted from a soluble protein into a transmembrane protein. So that character in that first cartoon was right. This is a miracle that happens during infection. So um, to summarize this part of the talk, uh, HPV traffics through the retrograde pathway to the nucleus. A viral cell penetrating peptide transfers a segment of L2 from the endosome into the cytoplasm. Once it's in the cytoplasm, the cytoplasmic retromer can bind to uh, the L2 protein and transfer it into the retrograde pathway. Therefore, HPV is a novel form of retromer cargo that utilizes a unique mechanism to access the retrograde pathway. And this work's been published in, in, in a series of papers. <clears throat> 
It also tells us something about what is the role of cell penetrating peptides in biology. As I said, uh, since 1988, they've been thought to transfer proteins into cells. That's not what this one does. Rather, it transfers a protein or a protein segment from one intracellular compartment into another, and possibly it converts a soluble protein into a transmembrane protein. So maybe the reason people haven't been able to figure out what these segments do is that they're looking for the wrong activity. Maybe they don't serve to take proteins into cells, but rather to move proteins around inside cells. And perhaps they're misnamed, and rather than being considered cell-penetrating peptides, really should be called membrane-penetrating peptides. So in the last few minutes, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some unpublished work. How can we use this basic mechanistic understanding to imagine a new way of, of preventing virus infection and tell you about the progress we've made? And again, this is work by Pengwei. So here's our model. L2 sticks into the cytoplasm, binds retimer, and that's essential for, for infection. If that's true, we imagine that if we could flood cells with short peptides that bind retimer, then it might, they might all bind the retimer and titrate retimer away from the incoming virus so the incoming virus would not be able to infect. So the first goal then was to design a peptide that might do this. So we designed a short peptide, uh, peptide, <laughs> Pengwei designed a short peptide um, that contains the binding site, that's essential for this idea to work. Now, the problem with peptide therapeutics is they don't get into cells very well. So how do we get this peptide into cells? Well, the virus has figured that out for us. Namely, it has a cell-penetrating peptide. So we simply can take a short bit of L2 that has a, the retrobinding site and the cell-penetrating peptide. We would predict this would drive the peptide into the cytoplasm where this would bind retimer and block infection. As controls, we... Um, built two mutant peptides, one with a mutant in the retinal binding site, and another with a mutation in the penetration uh, sequence. Well, this peptide very efficiently blocks infection. Here we're looking at infection by wild-type HPV-16 uh, virus at different concentrations of the peptide. You see a very nice dose-dependent inhibition of infection uh, with, with an IC50 around uh, 4 micromolar. So the, the peptide does block infection. It doesn't block SG40. SG40 is a totally unrelated virus that does not use retimer, so that's as predicted. And at these doses, the virus, the, the peptide, doesn't display any obvious toxicity. Uh, the next couple of experiments, I'll show you experiments using about this level of peptide around um, uh, 14 micromolar, which is quite effective, as you see, see here. First off, we asked, does it also block other HPV types? I told what I showed you before was type 16, but it also blocks type 18, like 16, a high risk genital type, and also type 5, which I mentioned before, is a skin type. So this peptide effectively blocks several cancer associated HPV types. We then looked at the mutations. Here are two mutations in the cell penetrating peptide. They both eliminate activity because it can't get into cells. And this is a mutation in the retinal binding site. This also eliminates activity because it can't bind retinal. So then we wanted to perform some experiments to confirm this proposed model of action, mechanism of action. Um, so first we wanted to say, does this peptide really prevent binding of retromer to virus? And, and it does here, this is a PLA experiment. So um, with a wild type virus, at eight hours after infection, you can see nice binding of um, peptide to the L1, pro actually to the L2 protein, but we measure L1 here. Um, however, if you add the peptide that uh, inhibits infection, you see you eliminate binding of the virus to, to the retimer. So as predicted, this peptide displaces retimer from virus. We've also done, this is a wild type peptide, we've also done experiments with the mutant peptide without a retimer binding site, and this does not displace the retimer as predicted. Well, if this is blocking the way we think it does, we have a prediction where the virus gets stuck, and that is it should accumulate in the endosome, just like happens when you mutate the retimer binding site, and again, that's exactly what happens at 16 hours after infection. By this time, the wild type virus has left the endosome. However, um, uh, if you add the peptide, uh, you prevent endosome exit, and the virus then accumulates uh, in the endosome. So just as I've told you before, this sort of is sort of a common pathway when you block infection at this step. We can cause endosomal accumulation and uh, prevent the virus from getting into these distal compartments by knocking down retromer, by mutating the retromer binding site, by mutating the cell penetrating peptide so the binding site never gets into the cytoplasm, or now by treating cells with a peptide uh, that has a cell penetration sequence to get the retro binding site into the cytoplasm. So 
this is sort of, a, as I said, the common pathway for uh, inhibition. So to summarize this, what I've showed you is that uh, a C-terminal L2 peptide specifically inhibits infection by several HPV types, but not unrelated viruses. Inhibition requires an intact binding site and a cell penetration sequence. The L2 peptide inhibits the interaction of incoming HPV to the retromer, and this causes HPV to accumulate in the endosome. So we think this uh, may at some point be a, a, really a, a new way of preventing virus infection, a new paradigm for antiviral activity. There are very effective antiviral agents out there, as you know. Most of them work, the vast majority, by inhibiting viral enzymes. So for example, in the case of HIV, we have inhibitors that block reverse transcriptase protease and integrase. They're very effective in combination therapy. There are some inhibitors that block binding of viruses to cells. There are some that block uh, disassembly of viruses, such as amantadine with influenza virus. And we're proposing that this may be a new way to block infection, namely to inhibit intracellular trafficking of the virus so it doesn't get to a site of replication by blocking the binding to an essential trafficking factor. So um, this is a Roach Motel approach. The virus checks in to the endosome, but it doesn't check out. So um, just close by acknowledging the people who did all the work. Uh, Alex uh, took the leap into HPV entry. We'd never studied entry before. Alex did SIR and a screen. He was an immunobiology graduate student. Did a terrific job and worked with Wei Zhang to uh, illuminate the retrograde pathway. Andrea, postdoc in the lab, showed that HPV binds, HPVL2 binds directly to retromer. And that's important for uh, endosome exit and infection. Then really a lot of uh, praise to Peng Wei Zhang, a uh, postdoc in the lab currently, who discovered this cell penetrating peptide, developed the split GFP assay, and then did the work I told you on peptide inhibition. He's done a terrific job. Um, I haven't had time to talk about uh, uh, John's work, but he is now looking in more mechanistic detail and identified proteins that regulate retromer function and block infection. Uh, Gabriel uh, worked a little bit with Peng Wei, do some sequence analysis. And we did a terrific um, collaboration with Chris Bird and some of our retromer work. Uh, and this is supported by grants from the NCI and the, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So I'll stop here, and I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you.